What's up, everybody? It is a delight for me to join with all of the various family members in this season and saying congratulations to those of you who are graduating. Whether you're graduating from pre-kindergarten or all the way up to postgraduate or you're graduating from a vocational institution, I just want you to know I join your family and friends in saying we are so proud of you. Listen, graduating in any season is a huge accomplishment. It's a big deal. But considering the last two and a half years, trauma after trauma after trauma and all of the drama and all of the pain that we've had to work through, the fact that you are graduating now is a super big deal. Heroic. And some of you may think, wow, I just got through based on, by the skin of my teeth. Or others may, may have come through with flying colors of, of all A's. It doesn't matter, guys. Listen, you graduated. That is a humongous accomplishment. And we are so proud of you. And I just want to give a special shout out to our special needs uh, students. Uh, you know, I went through school as, with ADHD, and so I have a, a little sensitivity here. There's been so many special needs students who are graduating despite whatever the challenges that you are facing. And I just want to call that out and just congratulate you and just tell you how incredibly proud I am. And for all of you, God has so much more for you in the future. All right, with that, uh, let's turn our attention to today's message. Uh, I've, I've labeled this message a word for the wise. Hopefully it's, a, it's an appropriate word for those of you who are graduating, but I know it is also a word for all of us who should see this moment as a pivotal time in our lives. The Apostle Paul writes in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, these incredible words. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. There ends the reading. Now, if the Apostle Paul lived in contemporary times, he would have one, if not two, PhDs in uh, religion and in philosophy. He was at the height, the top of the educational apparatus of his day. We find him here literally just before the end of his life, and uh, he writes these words. You might ask, well, why would I talk to people who are graduating and talk to all of us in this season uh, from the perspective of somebody who's writing at the end of his life? Well, there's a popular saying made popular by Stephen Covey, which says this, you should begin with the end in mind. Those of you who've gone through graduation ceremonies, you know they call those graduation ceremonies commencement ceremonies. The word commencement uh, also means beginning. And so as you graduate, as we move forward in life in this particular season, it is appropriate for us to begin with the end in mind. Actually, let me just read for you the quote that comes out of the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People written by Stephen Covey. Here's what he says. This is a quote in context. Begin with the end in mind. It's based on imagination. Can somebody shout imagination? Go ahead and type that in the chat. Imagination. The ability to envision in your mind what you cannot at present see with your eyes. And what he's saying is that you've got, to have a, you've got to have the imaginative capacity to kind of see where you want to end up at, to kind of imagine what do you want the, the story to be when you come to the end of your life. And the Apostle Paul here at the end of his life, he's actually facing being beheaded at the guillotine for his faith. And at the end of his life, he's able to say, I have fought a good fight. I've finished the race. Uh, I've kept the faith that, that, that I've ended up in terms of my story inside of the unfolding Jesus story is exactly what I would have wanted it to be, a story of faithfulness. Wow. You know, uh, I think Pastor Tilden, I, I listened to Pastor Tilden's message a few weeks ago, weekends ago, and he did a wonderful job talking about the kind of the five acts of the, of the biblical story. Uh, creation, fall, Israel, the coming of Jesus, and then we're that fifth act, right, where we live out everything that we've learned about God, particularly uniquely expressed in Jesus throughout the biblical tradition. And the one thing that we learn about God is that God is faithful. And the second thing that we learn about God, uh, using what P.T. laid out as a framework, is that we're part of God's story. And Paul was uniquely part, not just God in the abstract, but of Jesus' story. And he said, you know what? I 
was faithful. Can you imagine where you want to end up at in life? Well, here's something that I want you to consider, all of us, whether you're graduating or not. It would be a horrendous thing to live your life and get to the end of it and discover you've lived your life in vain. It would be a horrendous thing to spend the bulk of your life climbing the ladder of success and discover that when you get to the top of that ladder, towards the end of your life, that the ladder was leaning against the wrong wall. And so there's some wisdom here for the wise. And the first insight is starting with the end in mind. The second insight, like bricks bounces straight out of the text. Listen to what he says. Paul says, I have fought the good fight. He didn't just simply say, I fought the fight. He says, I fought the good fight. See that adjective in there? The good fight. In other words, I, I, I fought the right fight. Now, if Paul was here, he would tell you that the first half of his kind of career of faith and and, uh, and half of his adult life, he was fighting the wrong fight, the wrong fight. He, 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 he says, uh, he writes about it uh, actually in, in Galatians, for you have heard of my previous way of life, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it, he wrote. He says, I, I didn't believe in Jesus and the folk who were trying to proclaim Jesus. I was trying to wipe them off the face of the earth. I was murdering them and imprisoning them. But he was fighting the wrong fight. And then he had an encounter with Jesus and Jesus turned him around and it became a part of the story of Jesus. So here's the first insight. Choose the right fights. If you want to make sure that you're living the most productive, the most effective life possible, make sure you're choosing the right fights. So much of what we see going on around us are people engaged in the wrong fights. Now, let me just take a moment and just talk about relationships for just a moment. Uh, it took me 10 years to figure this out, but check, check this out. I went from a C-plus husband to an A-plus husband by learning two words. It took me 10 years to learn these two words. Okay, are you ready for it? Yes, dear. <laughs> <laughs> Once I learned those words, boy, marriage became great. <laughs> Let's just practice that. Type that in the chat. Yes, dear. All right? Yes, dear. <laughs> What's my point here? It took me 10 years to learn that not every battle is worth fighting. It took me 10 years to learn that I didn't need to control everything, that everything didn't need to necessarily go the way I thought it needed to go. It took me 10 years to figure out, you know what, when it comes to the final analysis of the life that I want to live, where I want to end up at, whether we go this direction or that direction to get to the event that we're going to, whether that wall is green or red, whether we do curtains or shades, you know, really, whether we watch what she wants to watch or watch what I want to watch, at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter that much. It doesn't matter at all, actually. And the moment I pull back, you know, you know, there's some scripture here as well. Husbands, love your wives like Christ loved the church and gave his life for them. You know, created space, giving up ground that you see is rightfully yours. That's what the t text teaches, right? The moment I began to do that, the toxicity and the anxiety and the fighting that defined our environment began to dissipate. Now, that doesn't mean that we didn't have any fights, we didn't engage. It just means that I, 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 I saved my powder. Come on now, that, 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 that I reserved to fight the good fights, right? Uh, that, that we had to engage over whether or not God was calling us, how God was calling us to use our resources in a particular season. Okay, that's a fight worth fighting. Uh, how to work with our kids uh, in certain regards to make sure that the trajectory of their lives are as best as possible, fights worth fighting. But you know, that happens, that's not every week or every day. Be mindful of the fights you choose to fight. A word to the wise. Now, if Paul was here, he would say that the biggest fights that we have are really with ourselves. It's with those decisions that will either promote the purposes of God in our lives or will undercut the purposes of God in our lives. And he would say that the, the best approach to engaging those kinds of decisions is by learning to ask what, what uh, I heard Andy Stanley ultimately once, one time call the best question. Can you simply shout the best question? Type that in the chat. The best question. He addresses this in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15. 
you know, and here's what he writes. So be careful how you live. Now, let me just pause for a moment. The word careful could be translated thoughtful. Be thoughtful. The word that's captured here as live could be translated as step. Be thoughtful where you step. Be thoughtful about the next step that you're about to take. That step that you're about to take as it relates to finances. That step you're about to take as it relates to your career. That step that you're about to take as it relates to your relationship or it relates to what institution or your educational journey uh, or your journey of faith. Be, 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 be thoughtful about where you are stepping. Then the text goes on and says, well, how do I do this? He, he gets it very practical. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. And if Paul was here, he would say, essentially, here's what I mean. People who live foolishly, they ask one set of questions. People who live wisely, they ask a different set of questions. And those who live wise always ask this question. Is the step I'm about to take that could have real ramifications in my life, is that step wise? Is it wise? Now, if you heard uh, last weekend, uh, Sue Wonky did a wonderful message uh, talking about uh, how, to, how to prioritize uh, the most meaningful things in our life, P1, P2, P3, P4. If you missed that, I wish I had had that when I was graduating. If you missed that, I want to encourage you to go back next weekend, a week, uh, go to last week's message. Make sure you hear what Sue Wonky taught. It was fantastic that she used the Our Father prayer to frame a practical approach. I, I want to use this question, is it wise, to kind of get at the same thing, uh, uh, but from a different angle. This is what Paul would say. You know, is it right? Is it wrong? Good questions. Is it a sin? These are the kind of questions we generally ask. Good question. But is it wise? The best question. L- let me just underline this very quickly. Uh, uh, notice Ephesians 5, 16 through 17. This is what Paul says. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. I don't think we have to debate about whether or not these days are evil, right? He says you need to maximize every moment. You don't know how many moments you have. Uh, And so he goes on to say you ought to maximize. Don't act thoughtlessly. But understand what the Lord wants you to do. Another translation says understand what the Lord's will is. Here's a quick insight. Oftentimes we're asking the question, what is God's will for me in this particular area of life? And and, and, and here's the answer. Usually, whatever is the wise thing for you to do, that usually aligns with, yes, that's what God wants you to do. That's God's will for you in that part of your life. You know, (laughs) I I think about the person, you know, who, who, who says, you know what? I want to buy a, a, a Lamborghini, a, a, excuse me, I want to buy a Jaguar. And you do the research, you find a Jaguar costs $218,000. And so you come to me as your pastor, he says, listen, pastor, I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to buy a Jaguar, but I, I, I'm just trying to discern, is it God's will? So I, I'm going to ask you some questions as your pastor. I'm going to say, well, how much money do you make? And you're going to say, well, I think, I mean, I make about $85,000 a year. I say, okay, how much debt do you have? And you can say, well, you know, I've got about $350,000 off of debt, you know, my house and so forth and so on. Okay, how much money you got in savings? Oh, about $1,500 in savings. Okay, okay, okay. I can see what God's will is for you. <laughs> Go to Torres R Us down the car line. You can get you a $5 Ferrari, model Ferrari. That's God's will for you, all right? (laughs) Because that's the wise thing to do. Is it wise usually lines up with what God wants for your life. Okay. All right, let me suggest, teach you how to ask this question in three different ways. Is it wise? First of all, I want to suggest you should ask this question in, in, in from this perspective. Is it wise in light of my past? When I think about myself, my struggles and my failures and my addictions that I've worked for, the step that I'm about to take as it relates to this relationship, the step that I'm about to take, uh, you know, as it relates to this particular activity that I'm engaged in, is it 
wise. Listen to what uh, Moses writes in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 9. He's, he's about to move off the scene, and he's crystallizing these, the essential things that he wants the nation of Israel to make sure they don't forget. Notice what he says. But watch out. How should you watch out? Be careful never to forget. Come on, shout, never to forget. Write that in the chat. Never to forget what you yourself have seen. Do not let these memories, these, these, these experiences that you've had, don't you dare let them escape your mind as long as you live. As a matter of fact, I want you to make sure that you pass them down in story form to your children and your grandchildren. What is he saying? He said, well, first of all, I want you to remember the great miracles that God has worked. It tells you about God's faithfulness. I want you to pass those stories down. Don't you forget those miracles. But if you read the larger context, he's also saying, I want you to remember all of the different ways that you went astray. All of the different ways that you missed the mark. All of the different ways that you failed God and got trapped in the wrong patterns. And God had to find a way to deliver you out and through those patterns. I don't want you to forget that. I don't want you to let that leave your mind. Why? Because it informs your decisions going forward. It helps you to figure out what's wise and not wise. As a matter of fact, pass those, those failures, those, those mistakes. Make sure you tell those stories to the kids and the grandkids, just like you're telling them about the great things that God has done. It will impart wisdom to them as well. Hmm. Is it wise in light of my past? There's nothing wrong with eating sweet potato pie and, and cake and uh, having some candy along with some coffee, and, uh, except if you were diabetic. Because if you're a diabetic, it means that you can't eat that kind of stuff at the same level that everybody else. You can't do what everybody else does. It's not wise. If you get a call from that relationship that you had 10 years, 5 years ago, it was so horrendously toxic and abusive. And now you got an email, and after the email, there's a text, and now there's, a, there's an invitation. Can we restart the relationship? The question for you is, is it wise? It has nothing to do with whether he or she is a more improved version of themselves. It has to do with, come on now, uh, 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 what's wise for you and the history informing your decision. If you were a college student, you walk into a frat house, you're invited to go to a party at a frat house, not, nothing in particular per se wrong with that. But you walk into the frat house and it's, it's dark and the music is, is loud and you, alcohol is flowing and over there they're doing cocaine on the table and, 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 and you can see a little bit of the light and it looks like those folk over there are having sex and, and, and in the middle of the frat house you pray if you, you, you ask well God what's your will for me <laughs> let me tell you what his will is do the wise thing and get out of there see, God's will usually lines up with doing the wise thing okay Secondly, first is, is it wise in light of my past? Secondly, is it wise in light of my current season? Listen to what the writer of Ecclesiastes writes. He says, for everything there is a season, a time for every activity under the heavens. Do you know what season you're living in? You know, I remember my wife, I came home one night, one day, back in, in Boston when she was in medical school. First uh, two years of medical school was just absolutely brutal. I came home, she was bawling. I said, baby, what's wrong with you? She was saying, I'm just so tired of having to say no. I, no to all of the fun-filled family activities that, that, that she loves participating in with me and the kids and the, and the family. No to the stuff that was going on at the church that she was tremendous. She was the first lady of Roxbury Presbyterian Church, but, but she, she, was, she couldn't be present in all the things she wished she could be present. To no to flying across the country from Boston to San Francisco to, our annual, to the annual big family events that, that she had you know, had growing, gr grown up going to it, and, and that was so vital and so central to her understanding of family and who we were. No, and no, and no, and no. And yet Rhonda recognized that that was the season that she was in. 
And she was willing and able and ready to endure short-term pain that felt like an eternity. That was two years. It felt like an eternity, the first two years of medical school. But listen, she's been practicing medicine for about, you know, 26, 27 years. So what is two years in the larger context of 25 years, right? So she was prepared to do short-term pain in order to have long-term gain. That was the season that she's in. And the challenge for you and I, the want is to learn wisdom here, right? Is that sometimes we keep choosing this, the, the wrong pattern. Choose short-term pleasure that keeps landing us in long-term misery. Know the season that you're in and know that seasons change. They won't be here always, but you've got to be faithful in this season. Know your season and be faithful in that season. The question is, it was helps you to facilitate uh, your faithfulness in that context. And then the third context. So one, is it wise in light of my past, this, this step I'm about to take, this decision that I'm about to make, this experience that I'm about to partake in? Is it wise in light of my current season, this step that I'm about to, to execute? And then is it wise in light of my dreams for the future? Where I want to end up at, where I want to go. Listen to what Paul writes. I have fought a good fight. I have finished the race, the, 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 the course that God has charted out for, for the unfolding story of faithfulness, the goal that he has set out in terms of, of the, 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 the pinnacle moment of my faithfulness. Uh, I, I've completed it. My assignment on the planet, it's been done. It's been done. It's been, I've reached the ultimate apex of what I've lived for. It's been done. Is it wise in terms of where you want to end up at? You know, here's a very quick insight for those of you who like to uh, engage with social media. You know that one of the interesting things is that when people begin to interview you, and what we do it here at NBCC, that if we're thinking about hiring you, uh, among the reference checks that we do, all the checks we do, we also do a check of your social media. Because we learn a lot about a person by looking at their social media. The folks who are going to hire you five years from now, three years from now, ten years, they're going to always go and check your social media. So that picture that you're about to post on social media, that stuff that you're talking about and engaging in on social media, come on now. Uh, 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 when somebody three years from now or five years from now, when you get to your dream job and, and you've worked to get there and they go check your social media, will it undercut your future possibilities? Right. Is it wise in light of the future? Quick story. I heard uh, Matt Barnes, who's a former warrior, talk about when he used to play for uh, the Los Angeles Clippers, for a number of years, and he moved over to the Warriors, and he said he immediately recognized the difference when, uh, in terms of a championship team. Uh, because the Warriors was a championship team. He immediately saw it. And here's where he saw it at. Uh, the fact is that when practice was over, usually the gym gets empty when he was at his old team. And the Warriors, when practice was over, for the next hour or two, the floor was flooded with people out there working hard and working out on their own. On their own. So it doesn't matter who you're rooting for in the NBA finals, whether you're rooting for the Warriors or the Celtics. The fact of the matter is those young men who are going to be playing on the biggest stage, really fulfilling their lifetime dream, which is to be in the NBA finals, they made a ton of is it wise decisions about what to put in their body, about how, to, how hard to work, about what to do and what not to do. Where you want to end up at? Is the step that you're about to take, in light of that, is it wise? All right, here's the last step, and then we'll finish. <laughs> it says, I fought a good fight. I'm going to finish the race. I've kept the faith. You know, make sure you're choosing the right battles that you've... Make sure you're asking the right question, is it wise? And then make a commitment to keep the faith. Notice what he says. Paul says, I kept the faith. 
Paul says essentially what he's saying is I had to make the decisions. Kept, that means that, that, that was the decision he made. I had to repeatedly and ongoingly make the decision to keep my faith. He was shipwrecked so many times, but he had to decide to keep the faith. He was beaten and left for, for dead a few times, but he had to decide in the midst of that to keep the faith. In the valleys of life, he had to decide that I'm going to continue to trust in a God that is bigger than all of this experience because, because I'm living life with God. And, and when I'm in the valleys, you know, I love that psalm that declares, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, uh, I will fear no evil, for thou art what? With me. I'm living a with God life. And sometimes life will take me to the valleys, but God is with me. I make the decision that I'm going to keep trusting him. And when I'm on the mountaintop with all of the miracles that Paul experienced, I made the decision I'm going to keep trusting him. See, you have to make a decision about your faith. You have to decide that you're going to live a with God life. That is what's going to ultimately take you beyond the boundaries of this life into the ultimate graduation, into the ultimate uh, place of accomplishment. Dallas Willard once wrote, you know, so many young people are backing away from their faith because, you know, so much evil and violence is going on and they can't understand how that correlates with a reality of a loving and faithful and all-powerful God. And Dallas Willard talks about this with God's life commitment. And he says this, he says, this has special importance when I'm faced with the presence of evil and suffering in human life, my own or at large. He says, I realize that I will either allow my view of evil to determine my view of God and will cut God down accordingly. Or I will allow my view of God to determine my view of evil and will elevate God accordingly, accepting that nothing is beyond God's power to redeem for the good, ultimately. I mean, isn't that one of the remarkable things as we read through biblical history, thinking about the five acts of Scripture? Isn't it one of the remarkable things that as we look at the, the nation of, of Israel that's trapped in a famine, and, and yet God proves to be faithful, and they come out of the famine, they land in Egypt, and there they find a faithful God. And, suddenly, and then at some point, history flips on them again, and now for 400 years they're in slavery, and yet God proves to be a faithful God and delivers them out of out of slavery, and, 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 and biblical history says that for, for another 400 some years, it looks like heaven shut up, we didn't hear anything, and then Jesus comes, come on now, 42 generations down uh, 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 through the nation of Israel, Al comes not just to save Israel, but an instrument to bring salvation to the world. This notion of if you can just wait a while, come on now, that God is always at work, and if you can just hang on in there, God will be be faithful. God will be faithful. God will be faithful. It doesn't always look like what we claim faithfulness to be. I love Dallas Willis. I'm, I'm paraphrasing now. He says, you know, when we have a with God life, when, I'm, when I've decided that I'm going to keep the faith, that I'm going to do life with God, it means that wherever I end up at, it, 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 my, my with God faith shifts the perspective. Watch this. If I show up in an emergency because I know that I'm with God, I, I begin to pray quietly and center in my prayer, looking for God because he's able to do exceedingly abundantly more than I can ask or imagine. And even if he doesn't do what I want him to do, I know that he has loved me with an everlasting love and it's going to be all right because he's got me. He's got me. He's got me. If, 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 I, if, I, if, if I'm being praised and celebrated, I'm quick. Uh, when, when you live a with God's life, you're quick to, 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 to point people towards the goodness of God. You're able to declare with the psalmist, if it had not been for the Lord on my side, where would I be? Every good and perfect gift comes from the Father above. You, you, you factor that into the, to the praise and the celebration. When you're being condemned and you're, you're, you're falling under reproach, especially if you've done something that is wrong and guilt-ridden, 
Your with God life allows you to say, but the God that I know in Jesus says, if I confess my sins, he's faithful and just to forgive me and cleanse me of all unrighteousness. And when he cleans me up, therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If I clean my stuff and keep growing, yesterday's mistake will not hinder God's uh, future miracles for my life. That's a with God's life. That's a decision to keep your faith. To keep your faith. If you show up, wake up in disappointment, you're able to say, you know, I don't know how he's going to do it, but all things work together for the good for those who love the Lord. Paul says that he lived a with God's life. And now as he comes to the end of his life, He's preparing for the ultimate graduation. You know, that's what death does for those of us who die in Jesus. It's the ultimate promotion. Here's what he says. He says it like this. I love it. He says, he says, now there is stored up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, he will award to me on that day. It is the biggest award. It is the best graduation certificate. Come on. It is the most noteworthy accomplishment. It is the time when we hear Jesus himself declare, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You have been good over a few. Come on up. Listen to what Paul goes on to say. He says, he says, he says, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearance, to stand in his presence as the king of kings and lords of lords and the final, final arbiter, if you will, of life itself. Undoing the effects of evil, establishing the reign of righteousness. Yeah, that's the ultimate graduation. But until then, congratulations to those of you who are graduating. Happy graduation. God bless you. You know, this is your day. There's a person who's watching uh, this message, and you're ready to make a decision. You're ready to take a step forward towards faith that will radically change your life. And so if you simply scan the QR code right here on the screen, it's going to take you to Next Steps with Jesus. And for somebody, the commitment that you're ready to make right now today is say that you want to become a Jesus follower. You want him to be in charge of your future and your destiny. You want to be a part of his story moving forward. This is a chance, opportunity to do that. And if you, there's a space for you to indicate, if you want us to follow, with, follow up with you and help you with your next steps, we'd love to do it. And then here's my challenge to all of us who've just sat through and uh, listened to this message under the uh, message response. is simply this. I will begin to ask as I work through the various choices of life, is it wise? That's the question, guys. And then here's a reflection question I want to encourage you to uh, wrestle with. In what areas of my life am I currently choosing short-term gains that may be creating long-term misery? All right. Now, next week, guys, I want to make sure that you're with us. I'm kicking off a brand new series I'm calling Illusions. I'm suggesting that there are several illusions that can undercut the future that God has for you. But the moment we expose those illusions, my goodness, God can unleash the unexpected in your life. So make sure you get back here next week at our regular times, 9, 11 a.m. Pacific time. We'll be right here. And if you're in the local Bay Area, you can meet at either one of our campuses at 11 a.m.